How many people with a show of hands know somebody, have a family member who's been affected by cancer, the big C? A lot of people, a lot of people. Um, what is cancer? What is cancer? It's characterized by uncontrolled growth. Uncontrolled growth and changes in the genetic information. So no matter what the cancer is, there is change to the genetic information and it's, there's uncontrolled growth, okay? So this is a diagram that I adopted from the ABCs of Prayer, this book. And when we think about God's ultimate will, we know that nobody's gonna be sick again, right? That's in Revelation. Talking about God's original will. When he made everything, everything was good. But then we have another little section over here, God's permissive will. And there are some times when people are sick and they've not brought it upon themselves. We have an example of that in John 9 where this man was blind and the Pharisees were saying, um, it's because of him or his parents, they committed some kind of sin. But no, that was because God's name was going to be glorified. But there is another part where we are also responsible for just not taking care of our temples, right? So we want to focus on the part that we can do, right? So that we can do our part and let God do the rest. Okay, so no matter what kind of cancer it is, there are stages that are followed. So first of all, you have a normal cell. Skin cell, hair cell, red blood cell and there is some kind of change in the genetic information. And that change occurs, sorry, that change occurs because there is damage to the genetic information because of exposure to a cancer-causing agent. A cancer-causing agent can be chemicals, it can be viruses, it can be your food, okay? So first step is initiation where you have, or mutation. So there is change in the genetic information, right? Then you have the cell mutating. And mutating is just another word for changes. So mutation. And then there is promotion, another word for growth, right? So there is growth going on right here. And at this stage in promotion, we can either promote the growth or we can, we can, we can what do you call it, retard the growth right, by the lifestyle, by the lifestyle that we have. And then you have progression, further growth, and metastasis where it is now, progression is like invasion, it's now invading the neighboring tissues, and metastasis is now when it has spread. It's a big word for spread. So it's not in the original site anymore, so say, to, like for example, breast cancer. One of the primary sites of metastasis is the brain. So it's no longer in the breast person is now confused. It's now in the brain. Um, at these stages, metastasis and progression, it is possible for you to reverse cancer, but it is very, very difficult. So when you're still in progression and promotion, you can reverse with lifestyle changes. It is possible. Um, metastasis, it's difficult, but it is possible. Very difficult. You need a miracle here. Okay, so what are the stats on, global, on, on cancer? 8.8 .8 million persons in the world died from cancer in 2015. Um, that's nearly one in six deaths accountable, attributed to cancer. The most um, common cancers are lung, female breast cancer, bowel, and prostate. When we talk about bowel, we're talking about stomach, colon, the whole thing, colon mainly. Um, 23.6 million people, um, they're projecting that 23.6 million persons will die from cancer in 2030. So you see that this number is increasing. Um, according to the World Health Organization, 30 to 50% of cancers can be prevented if you address the modifiable factors. That's a big chunk, right? All right. Okay, so let's look at this. So this is a graph about how cancer is distributed, the types of cancer, and it compares the cancers in the developed nations and the less developed nations. So if you look over here, the red 
is the incidence. How often is this thing occurring? The blue is how many people are dying. So for example, lung cancer, more developed regions, you see most highest incidence, right? But let's look at, say, lung cancer in a less developed area. Do you see that there is a mirroring in the mortality? Right. So let's look at breast. So here you have the more developed areas and less developed areas. So you have probably the same amount in terms of incidence, but the mortality, people are dying more in the less um, developed areas. Let's look at prostate cancer. This is male cancer. So here we have again, here we have again the incidence here. The incidence is in blue now. Mortality is in red, like how many people dying. So highest in like the developed countries have the highest amount, the highest incidence of male cancers. But if you look in the Caribbean, look at this mortality. It's higher than even in the developed countries, right? Female. And we're seeing the same trend here. The mortality is greater in, in, in different areas, like in the areas that are quote unquote less developed, right? So we are being affected, right? Um, so what are the, some of the things that are considered risk factors? Can you name, th think about some and tell me. Hmm? Overweight, Overweight uh-huh. Cigarette. Cigarette smoking. Sugar, okay. So diet, hygiene, lifestyle, health, family history. Some of these factors, can we change them? Yes. So you have modifiable factors. These are factors that you can change, such as lifestyle. If you're smoking, you can change your environment. You can change the food that you eat. You can change if you exercise or not. But you can't change your gender, right? You can't change your genetics. Right, so when we look at this iceberg here, right, how much of the iceberg is underneath? Most of it. So when you get a diagnosis of cancer, just always remember that. If you get any kind of diagnosis, it's just 10% of the problem. There is a lot of stuff that's going on that can contribute to this diagnosis. There will always be a cause. There will always be a cause for the diagnosis. It didn't just happen. Okay. Genetics. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit, a little bit more. Can't change that. Um, if you have a family history of cancer, especially like a first degree relative, so mom, sister, daughter, you know, you're going to be at risk for for certain cancers. For example, breast cancer. But that's that's a very small percentage of risk. Free radicals. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more. Tobacco. In cigarettes, you have 80 known carcinogens, 80 known cancer-causing agents in cigarettes. Um, you can be affected if you're a smoker or if you're a secondhand smoker. Inflammation. Inflammation is like the, this little quiet thing. Incognito, involved in every disease process. Okay, and inflammation, when people think about inflammation, they think about swollen, hot joints, achy. You, don't, you can be walking around with chronic inflammation and you don't even know it. Medications, some medications, especially if you were treated with chemotherapy in your younger years, early childhood, you are at risk for developing cancers later on, especially the blood cancers. Hormones. Persons who are living on the western side of the world, especially women who eat flesh foods, tend to have a higher estrogen than those who are typically on a plant-based diet. And this was found in the China study, radiation industrial chemicals. So people say, oh, you know, I have a family history of, of, of cancer, so I, I'm gonna be definitely at risk. Look at this, five to 10% of colon cancers are related to your genetics. Right? Remember, World, World Health Organization said what? 30 to 
of, the, of, of, of your cancer, your cancers are preventable if you address the modifiable factors, right? Dietary influence is responsible for about 35% of cancers. So if you have somebody in your family with, with colon cancer, your diet trumps your genes, right? 20 to 25% of women who have been diagnosed with ovarian cancer have a family history. 13 to 16% of women with breast cancer have a first degree relative, like mom, sister, um, daughter, have a first degree relative with breast cancer. Five to 10% of all prostate cancers are hereditary, like have a genetic influence. According to research, they've said that family history is the most um, significant predictor for, for prostate cancer. But that can be family history. But there was a study that was done by Dean Ornish in 2008 and with changes in lifestyle, there was a reduction in gene expression, and these persons did very well. So yes, you might have a family history, and these persons were diagnosed with prostate cancer, by the way, but it, they were in like the early stages, stage one, stage two, and most of them progressed to live normal lives with changes in lifestyle. Okay, 8% of lung cancers are hereditary. Um, you have some cancers, lung cancers, where you just don't smoke. But the reality is that 80 to 90 percent of lung cancers are related to like smoking history and stuff like that. All right. So we, we talked about free radicals. Free radicals, basically, I, sometimes it's difficult to explain. So I think this diagram is very, very simple. So when you have a stable molecule, right, look at all of these, um, like say, let, let's call them docking sites. Right, so our receptors. You notice that all of these sites here are satisfied. They're filled, right? So this is a stable molecule. In a free radical, right, is an unstable molecule, there is something that is missing, right? There is one port that's not filled. And how do you, how do you have, how are free radicals generated in the body? Free radicals are generated in the body through a process called oxidation, right? And this process happens in certain conditions. So you have pollution, air pollution can contribute to free radical generation. Um, fried foods, eating fried foods, that's another one. Tobacco exposure, alcohol, and pesticides, right? So, Antioxidants have extra molecules to share. So when you have a diet that's rich in antioxidants with all the beautiful colors of the food, you will have extra um, molecules or charge or electrons to share with the free radical to make it stable again. This makes sense? Okay. Disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. In case of sickness, the cause should be ascertained unhealthful conditions should be changed, wrong habits corrected, then nature is to be assisted in her effort to expel impurities and to reestablish right conditions in the system. So when you have a diagnosis, is, does that mean that it just popped up by itself? No, there is a cause and there's something that you probably did to contribute to this. Of course we have, you know, the exception to the rule, but for most cases, we have done something to contribute to this disease state, right? So what should we do? We should find the cause, right? And correct the wrong habits, right? So we know that pesticide and herbicide exposure can contribute to the generation, the formation of free radicals. So how can we lessen our exposure to herbicide, pesticide? So there was, a, there was a documentary and they compiled a list of foods that contain a higher residual of chemicals. This is called the Dirty Dozen. This is from PBS. So on these foods, you have a higher residue of chemicals, right? So you want to buy these things organic as much as possible. Apple, celery, grapes, blueberries, potatoes, spinach, nectarine, um, bell peppers, strawberries, lettuce, cucumbers. So these are things that you want to buy organic. If these things are imported, you can, 
<laughs> know 100% that they were exposed to even more chemicals to preserve them on the way to get to the country. So it's better for you to eat what is there naturally grown locally. Clean 15. So these are some of the examples of Clean 15. They tend to have a tougher skin and have many outer layers. So you can get away with you know, buying you know, regular. Doesn't have to be organic. So things like grapefruit, kiwi, asparagus, mango, and all of that, all right? There was a study that was done, the China study, very famous study. Information was collected for over 20 years. There were over 6,000 um, subjects that were studied, so the information is very robust. It's good data. And um, information was collected um, in 65 counties of China, and they compared with the American population. So if we look at this um, chart here, what is something that stands out to you? Let's talk about the fat intake. 14.5% of fat calories, of calories from fat comes um, in, is accounted for, 14.5% of the calories um, in the Chinese diet is attributed to fat, right? And then, but look at the United States. In the United States, it's 34 to 38%. What do you notice about the, the fiber intake? This thing won't work. Right, so 33 grams of fiber in China, 12 in the United States, right? And why is this important? Because United States is a trendsetter. Most countries follow what is being done here, right? Um, protein, 64 um, grams of protein in China, 91, higher protein intake in the US diet. And 0.8% of that protein is from animals in China, 10 to 11% is from the US, okay? But look here, China, 26, 2,641 calories they're consuming more calories, right? In the United States, 1989, like 1,989 calories. So they're consuming more calories in China, but most of these calories are from plants, right? All right, so this information is also from the China study. What they've noticed is that there is a higher incidence of colon cancer, this was particular among females, with a higher meat consumption. So if you look to the right, to the right, it, as it, you know, you look at the bottom here and it's increasing here. So this is how much meat people are eating. And this over here is the incidence of colon cancer. So the more meat you eat, the more incidence you have of cancer, right? Animal fat and breast cancer. Here we go again. More animal fat intake, higher incidence of breast cancer. See these countries over here? New Zealand, USA, Netherlands, so on. So what is the takeaway from the China study? We need to increase our fiber. We need to lower our fat intake. And we need to decrease how much animal protein we consume, right? Why is fiber important? How much fiber do, should you consume on a daily basis? The recommended is 25 to 35 grams of fiber. The typical American eats less than 15 grams per day. Can you ever take too much fiber? Uh, I don't know. But one thing I can caution you with is if you're going to increase your fiber, make sure you're drinking water because it can become like cement, right? And you have different kinds of fiber, right? So you have fiber that is soluble, and this is fiber that will become like a jelly-like substance when you consume it. So things like chia seed, flax seed, oatmeal, it becomes like gel-like gel when you consume it. And then you have insoluble fiber. All kinds of fiber we cannot digest. We can't, but we have benefit from it, right? And then you have the insoluble fiber, which works like a brush inside, like your brands. 
and it basically cleans out the GI tract as it goes down. Okay, um, high fiber diet decreases breast cancer by up to 50% from a study that was done in 1994. Um, See, the average American woman, not only woman, but people in general, eat less than 15 grams of fiber per day. Um, there was some information that was compiled by Dr. Michael Greger, and they have found that, they found consistently that a high consumption, they found that 60 grams of fiber was consistently, not really proven, but was associated with reversal of chronic diseases, high blood pressure, diabetes, okay? Multiple studies have found that there is a decreased risk of colon cancer when you consume fiber. So, and premenopausal women have a lower risk of breast cancer if they consume a high fiber diet also, okay? How do you get your fiber? Let's look at a list here, okay. So if you, lentils, let's look at lentils. A cup of lentils will give you 15.6 grams of fiber. That's more than half of what you need for the day, right? Um, let's look at, let's look at chickpeas. <laughs> One cup will give you 12.5 grams of fiber, right? And people say, oh, I need to eat animal foods to get my protein. Lies. Let's look at <laughs> chickpeas. If you eat one cup of chickpeas, you get 14.5 grams of protein, right? Um, if you eat one cup of lentils, you get 17.9 grams of protein. What do you notice on this list? Everything has some protein and everything has some fiber, right? So some might not have a lot, even lettuce. Lettuce surprised me. Lettuce, one cup of shredded lettuce has 0.5 grams of protein. So you can get protein from lettuce. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> so that's no excuse, right? You have no excuse. So what about sugar? It's vegan, right? Yeah, it's vegan. What's the counsel? Sugar is not good for the stomach. It causes fermentation, and this clouds the brain and brings a peevishness into the disposition. So you're just like really cranky, easily irritated. And from the light given me, sugar, when largely used, is more injurious than meat. Sugar consumption in all forms, right? will impair the ability of the white blood cells to destroy biological agents. Biological agents are like, path like pathogens, viruses, cancer, bacteria. This effect begins within 30 minutes and lasts for five hours. After two hours, the immune function is reduced by 50%. So it says sugar consumption in all forms. So yes, Honey is healthier than consuming white sugar, but sugar in all forms. So in moderation, in moderation. So what are some of the foods that we can use to combat or decrease our risk against cancer? Flaxseed. Most people know flaxseed. This is very rich in a phytochemical called lignans. It's not the only thing that has lignans. Um, it also has omega-3 fatty acids. <coughs> Chia seeds, omega-3 fatty acids. And these, they're not sure how omega-3 fatty acids help to reduce cancer risk and decrease cancer growth, but they're thinking it has something to do with how, it, it, it has some, something to do with the cell cycle regulation, the cell death, the cell growth, so on and so forth, okay? What about, like, what about tomatoes? This is um, very rich in an antioxidant called lycopene, okay? Lycopene accumulates in the prostate. It accumulates in the prostate, so anybody who, men should be eating a lot of tomatoes. That's if you don't really have arthritis, right? Because <laughs> it can contribute to pain. Right, mm-hmm. 
Then you have capsaicin. This is, this is the same thing that, this is what I would call bird pepper. This thing over here, clicker is not really working. Yeah, bird pepper. Um, the, the compound is called capsaicin. Um, not really sure, they're not really sure how it works, but they found that it helps to prevent, it's very important for circulation, good circulation, and it helps to prevent the growth. How do you spell the name? Capsaicin. C-A-P-S-A-I-C-I-N. And then you have turmeric over here, right? Something very interesting about turmeric. Turmeric is able to turn on, there is a gene, a suppressor gene called P53. And turmeric is able to upregulate or turn on this gene. This gene is very important to decrease for tumor growth, in decreasing tumor growth. And turmeric is able to upregulate P53. Isn't that amazing? It's able to upregulate P53 and suppress the growth of tumors. Onions. And I'm going to talk about onions on the next list. But you have onions. It is rich. These are what you would call allium vegetables. So onion, garlic. Green onions, a scallion, they have um, their allium, they're, they're from the allium family. These are one of the most powerful anti-cancer um, agents. Then you have your carrots, or your things that are rich in vitamin A. Those orange, rich in, this is rich in beta carotene, but Namely, it's vitamin A that you want. Um, it's a powerful antioxidant. And remember what your antioxidant is doing? It's providing extra elect um, electrons so that the, the free radicals can now become stable again. Because free radicals will steal electrons from anything, from your DNA, from any kind of tissue, just to be stable again. Right? All right? Then you have your cruciferous vegetables. So cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, very powerful. They have organosulfur compounds. And persons who consume a diet rich in this, you're going to have less growth, less risk of having cancer, right? Um, does anyone know what's in the, the left lower corner? This is sorrel or hibiscus. Yes, we drink it during Christmas time, right? This has acanothiacins. It's an antioxidant. Acanothiacins give it the rich red, purple looking color. And these things are right in your backyard. And even if you don't grow it, you can buy it at the store, right? And this has anti cancer properties. Remember, anything that's antioxidant, you need antioxidants so that you can stabilize free radicals. Legumes, so all your beans. Persons who eat beans, they have noticed that persons who have lived the longest consume the most legumes across the board. Doesn't matter where you're from. Doesn't matter where you're from. Consume more beans, likelihood you're going to live longer. Okay? Um, what about soybeans? There's a lot of controversy about consuming soybeans, especially um, in the setting of breast cancer. But what they've found is that soybeans have isoflavones, phytochemicals, meaning plant chemicals, and they're able to turn on BRCA1. So in, you have different ca causes of um, breast cancer. Persons who have a BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation are more, they would say, more at risk to, um, to develop aggressive breast cancer. Soybeans have phytochemicals that are able to turn on BRCA1 and BRCA2. BRCA1 and BRCA2 are suppressor genes. So they are supposed to suppress the growth of breast cancer cells, right? But they've noticed that in persons with aggressive breast cancer, this gene is turned off. Soybeans has the phytochemicals that's able to turn that back on. And they did a study where they noticed that there was more expression of BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes when, 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 when the, it was an in vitro study when the breast cancer cells were exposed to those phytochemicals. Isn't that amazing? 
Another thing to consider too is that remember that the estrogen that comes from, from plants, from, like from soybeans, it's less strong. It has a less estrogenic effect than the estrogen that your body makes. So what will happen is that if you consume soybeans, like in the setting of a breast cancer um, diagnosis, the phytoestrogen from the soybeans will sit on the, the receptor and block the effect of your estrogen. So you will have less growth. So even though, you know, research is saying, well, you know, if you if you don't eat, don't eat soybeans if you have um, um, if you have cancer, breast cancer. That's not it's not, there has been no study to show that there is a growth or increased death with soy consumption. Soy beans, I'm not talking about the analogs, soybean consumption. In fact, they did a study in China where they saw that there was a 29 um, percent reduction in death and recurrence with soybean consumption in breast cancer patients. Okay, and these foods here, so your green leafy vegetables, right? Your kale, your spinach, your collards, and your bright colors. You need a lot of vitamin C, vitamin A, and all of these things are locally available, should be, right? Or you can plant them, mangoes guava, cherry, right? Sweet peppers, one of the highest, um, th that has the highest um, amount of vitamin C actually on this picture, on this slide. So there was a study that was done and this was, um, I think it was about, I'm not sure if it was up to 40 phytochemicals, so plant chemicals, so the extract from different plants and they exposed different cancer cells to these chemicals from these plants and they watch for growth, right? So on this, on the bottom half here, you have jalapenos, tomatoes, lettuce, so on and so forth. And then over here, they're looking at the proliferation. How much is this thing growing? So we're looking at lung cancer here. What do you notice on the graph? There is no growth in garlic when, 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 when the cells are exposed to garlic. Leek, green onion, and Brussels sprouts. Prostate cancer. What do you notice again? Garlic and Brussels sprouts. There's no growth. Um, there's some in broccoli, leek, and green onions. Okay. And let's look at breast cancer. Breast cancer, what again? Garlic, leek, green onions, Brussels sprout, cauliflower, there's no growth. So if somebody has cancer or you are at risk for cancer, what should you be eating? Garlic. 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 <laughs> okay. All right, there are some foods. Another property of cancer is that it's able to influence cells around it to say bring nutrients create new blood vessels, a process called angiogenesis. There are some foods that you can eat to decrease angiogenesis. Of course, we are recommended a plant-based diet, so we're going to look on this list and pick out some things that are plant-based. Um, you can um, watch the, the presentation on this. This was a TED Talk by Dr. William Lee, How to Starve Cancer. And this is a list that was compiled. So a lot of these things on this list are easily accessible, right? So we have pumpkin, parsley, garlic, tomato, right? Turmeric, lemons, apples, pineapple, cherries, grapefruit, oranges, blueberries, all of these things. <laughs> Remember, I said, yes. Yes, we are promoting plant-based, um, yeah. All right, so <laughs> look on the list and choose, right? Choose accordingly. But um, these, are, these are foods that are easily accessible and they help your body, right? They help to combat cancer. All right, so what else can we do? Exercise. 
It's a recommendation of the American Cancer Society that we should be getting 30 minutes a day of moderate to vigorous activity five times a week. What does exercise do? It stimulates the release of white blood cells, interleukin-1 interleukin and 2, these and interferon. These are your body's natural chemotherapeutic agents. Natural chemotherapeutic agents, okay? That increases natural killer cells. We talked about that a little bit yesterday, that natural killer cells are your important white blood cells. They, are, they scout out the area. They kill anything that is not supposed to be there, right? Um, there is an increased risk of colon cancer and endometrial cancer with those who have increased TV viewing. So if you have a very sedentary lifestyle, you're increasing your risk of not only colon, endometrial, and also lung cancer, okay? Um, another benefit of exercise is that it decreases the amount of circulating estrogen and progesterone. This is very important for everybody, but especially for those who have receptor positive breast cancer. So typically when they do the breast cancer, they do a biopsy and they do hormone testing, the sensitivity of it. So it might be estrogen positive, um, progesterone positive, right? So it would respond to a higher amount of estrogen that's floating around and progesterone, right? If you exercise, it decreases the amount of circulating estrogen and progesterone, okay? Um, it promotes lymphatic drainage, right? Lymph is very important. This is where you have, this is where your cells, your white blood cells are housed and they survey things and liquid. So let's do a lymphatic drainage activity. Everybody stand up, please. So lymphatic drainage activity, you can jump, you can skip, or you can slap yourself, literally. So what you do, you start from the foot and you literally slap. And it should sting a little bit. And it should feel warm. It should sting. And it should feel warm. That's circulation right there, right? And for the hands, you clap. This, you have things in here, right? And you slap. should feel warm, right? And kind of itchy. That circulation, right? For your ears, you're gonna do this. It should start feeling hot, right? And then you kind of, if you have nails, be careful, right? And then you scratch right here. And then, of course, we can't do it in here, but <laughs> you can do this every day. It's free. Do you feel itchy? I feel itchy. That's circulation right there. And you can use something called a dry brush at home, right? And you always start from the foot up, coming up, because the center of your lymphatic system is right in the trunk, okay? So you work from the head down in this way and from the foot up in this way, okay? All right. Okay. <laughs> All right, what about water? Do you know that if you consume water, you decrease your risk of breast, colon, and bladder cancer? Okay, just by drinking enough water, all right? Another way that water can be used to, to combat cancer is through hydrotherapy. One of the things we use here is um, a fever bath or a hyperthermia bath, and that helps to stimulate the release of white blood cells and at a temperature of like typically 108, it actually kills the cancer cells. Um, you should do it with supervision at first to see how you tolerate it and then move forward. Okay, so these are some of the natural ways that you can combat cancer. What about sunshine? You need your sunshine for what? Vitamin D. They've found that vitamin D is significantly lower in persons with cancer. Typically, especially like a person with aggressive breast cancer, in any, most cases I've seen, the vitamin D is in single digits all the time, all the time. So they, they're not sure, you know, how, why, why does this happen? 
You know, in fact, they're, they're realizing that vitamin D is involved in many chemical reactions in the body, and they're thinking that it's involved in the regulatory process, actually. Um, it's just that the, the lower the vitamin D, the worse your prognosis. That's just what they found out. So make sure you check this level. Your optimal level is around 70 to 80. It's not 35. It's 70 to 80. 90%, up to 90% of your vitamin D is made when you go out in the sun. Your body can make this. But it needs to be deliberate exposure. It cannot be exposure, oh, I'm just walking down the street, right? You have to have skin exposed, and it needs to be deliberate. For a darker complected person, it's about 40 minutes. For somebody who is light complected, it is about 15 minutes. If you're at risk for skin cancer, just go ahead and take the supplementation. Okay, um, you need your sunshine for serotonin, right? You need serotonin because serotonin is the precursor for melatonin. Persons with lower melatonin, especially for females, they have noticed that there is an increased incidence of breast cancer. There is an inverse relationship between estrogen and melatonin. The lower your melatonin, the higher your estrogen. People who work at nights, very significant for them. They did a study among nurses and found that nurses who were working at night had a 60% increased incidence of breast cancer. Okay, so get your sleep. Get your sleep, get your sunshine. All right, and remember, serotonin is going to increase, improve your mood right remember that depressed persons have what increase inflammatory markers and infl inflammatory markers promote what proliferation growth it inhibits the natural cell death cycle apoptosis right you don't want that because cancer is taking advantage of all of those things right Basically what this thing is saying, this, this, this slide, if you eat more, the likelihood of you developing cancer is higher. Persons who consume more than two meals a day had increased incidence of colon cancer. That's what the study says. Okay, four meals a day was associated with double the risk for colon and rectal cancer. Okay, so there is a reason behind the two meal plan, right? <laughs> fresh air. Fresh air is important for good oxygen and it is important for optimal functioning of natural killer cells. It cleans the lungs, which is another organ that can help you to get rid of toxins, right? If you're not getting enough sleep, you're going to develop immune, immune, immune dysregulation, right? Your immune system is not going to be functioning optimally. When you're in your deep sleep, this is your delta three, this is deep sleep where you're basically paralyzed, right? That's when you have immuno, um, you have memory formation in the immune system. So if you were exposed to a pathogen during the day, that's when you know, memory is stored and filed and processed. Okay, we'll use that for later. But if you're not getting deep sleep, right, right, the restorative sleep that you need, you're not going to form that memory. So a person like that is going to be, you know, constantly getting colds, getting sick every, you know, so very often. But more so, you could be increasing your risk for cancer, okay? So remember, we talked about how um, melatonin, lack of adequate sleep associated with decrease melatonin levels and increased incidence of breast cancer among women, okay? So remember that you don't have to be achy to have chronic inflammation. You can have chronic subacute, low-grade inflammation by not getting enough sleep, by being irritated, depressed, your mood is not regulated. You remember depressed people? have in increased inflammatory markers. People who are not sleeping have increased inflammatory markers. So those are areas that if you need to pay attention to. It's not only the food that you eat. Rest. 
Look at what it says. Sleep deprivation caused 40 to 60% average increase in inflammatory markers. What is sleep deprivation? You need to get at least seven hours nightly. Six, I mean, five hours is not enough. It's not enough, okay? And remember I said that um, inflammation causes proliferation, differentiation, inhibit natural cell death, apoptosis, and promote angiogenesis. Um, there's a talk that I've done on epigenetics, right? And one of the things that they found out is that despite you have, you, everybody is born with your, your genetic information from mom, dad, whatever. Um, but there are some genes that can promote, there are control areas on these genes, epigenetics, right? And these genes can be changed based on your lifestyle. Seven nights of too little sleep was associated with changes in, your, in the genetic information. This was a study that was done in 2013. So you can be taking your first step towards cancer development by not getting enough sleep. And that's totally in your hands, right? Remember what the speaker said. What is really important? Does everything have to get done today? We have to prioritize. And you must prioritize on your sleep. There was an article that was, was um, I wouldn't say published, but um, that I received yesterday from Harvard. And they talk about aging well, putting priority on your sleep. You know, a lot of times people you will scrump on sleep saying that, oh, I can make up later. If you don't make up for it, your body will take it. So you can take it on the road or you pay for it later. Okay, so just don't, don't underestimate the importance of resting. And when we talk about rest, um, we can relate it to, to trusting in God. That spiritual rest, right? Because we cannot control everything. You can do everything. You can exercise. You can drink all your water. You can do all these things. And we don't live in a perfect world. And things still happen. So you can't put your trust in only the food that you're eating or the water that you're drinking or the exercise that you're doing. You must put your trust in, a con in, in God who is constant, right? So keep your mind stayed on him. Keep your mind stayed on Christ, and he will keep you in perfect peace, right? He will never give you more than you can be, or one. Two, you don't need to be anxious because you can present everything to him, and he will keep your heart in perfect peace, right? And he has the power to, to deliver you from the destruction of disease. He does. He, all he has to do is to say the word, right? So... Put your trust in divine power because he is capable, because he's reliable, right? And do your part. Any questions? Yes? L1? What do you mean? Interleukin? It's um, interleukin-1 and interleukin-2. They are cytokines. I don't know how to break that down. But they're chemicals that, you, that are natural in your body. And they're like natural chemotherapy. They're natural chemotherapeutic agents. And they're released when you exercise. Not just, you know, it, it has to be like kind of aerobic activity. Not, you know, moseying along. Yeah. So the question is, is this night sleep the same as day sleep? The only way that the, the day sleep will be the same as the night sleep is if you change your entire life. So if you're working nights, you have to function like a night person. So even when you're off, you need to function like a night person. That's when it will, it will be beneficial to you because you have people who live on the other side of the world, right? Yeah, and their time zone is different. So you would have to make the room dark. You have to practice regularity, you know, even when, even when you're off. That's when it would be beneficial.
Mm -hmm. What other options to clean fruits? Unhealthy fruits, <laughs> inorganic, the, the, are, are the foods. Okay, so if it's cleaning, I can use, I use um, lemon, I use salt, right? But I mean, the reality is everybody won't, will not be able to purchase organic all the time. In those situations, you pray and you ask God to remove the impurities, both natural and unnatural. And bless and eat. I have to find that, the, the, but if you type it in in Google, it will be there. Like Dirty Dozen Clean 15. Okay. Yeah, Dirty Dozen Clean 15 PBS documentary. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. So the different stages of cancer in metastasis, um, is it reversible, irreversible? Um, there are stages where um, very few cases where we've seen stage four where persons have been healed. Very rare. Um, but it can happen. It's a higher chance. In metastasis, it typically is irreversible. Right, so the comment is to invest in your health by as much as possible purchasing organic foods and um, leaving the rest to God. The fats that they're, we're talking about primarily in the China study was from animal fat. No, it wasn't from that. Mm -hmm. Yes. But you're using it for the omega, right. That, is, that can be consumed, it's, it is a source of omega-3. It is a source of omega-3, but you can also get it from, from flaxseed and chia seed. You wouldn't fry in an omega-3, um, like, like flaxseed, you're not supposed to heat it at all, right? It's, it's best to avoid fried foods. Um, I mean, if you go to somebody's house and that's what they have, I would not say, you know, insult the person. You know, eat it and pray, but don't do it at your house. <laughs> We have to be practical. We have to be practical, right? I'm sorry, I didn't hear your comment. Yes. Yes. 
Um, why are Caucasians not at increased risk for prostate cancer um, when compared with the black population? Um, they said familial is the, the main, the main um, predictor of it. I'm not sure. I'm not sure why I've never looked into it, and that's something that I am going to look in and give you an answer before. Whether it's I still don't know or they don't know, but I look into it. Um, I don't know why. I don't know why, but it is known that um, among the black population it's very aggressive and it's much more prevalent. It's family history, it's genetics, it's genetics, but diet does play a role in it too. We can't remember that gen genetics only accounts for what, eight to 10%, right? So we can't just always blame it on genetics, right? So thank you for your questions. I will touch base with people who wanna ask questions after. Um, this is a lot of information. You have ammunition, you do, right? You have ammunition to decrease your risk, and God wants us to be healthy. So I'm just going to say a short prayer, because when you have all this information, you are now responsible, right? <laughs> Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you care so much about your children. And we ask you, God, to just please give us the power to, to surrender everything to you, Lord, and do what we can do the exercise, the water, but Lord, ultimately help us to trust you. Help us to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.